and she said, well, my, my husband's six foot three, he's 190 pounds, he's 40 years old, big brown wavy hair, uh, very fit, he's so good to us, and, and her friend looked at her and said, well, your husband's five foot five, he's fat, he's bald, and he's really bad to you, and she said, yeah, but I don't want him back, <laughs> so you may not want me back, or any of the others that come, but it is a privilege to be with you. My name is Brian Hauser. I serve as Director of Missions for the Amarillo Area Baptist Association, of which Hereford is, is a valuable member. We thank you for your participation. I'm usually aware that most people have no clue what the association is or who it is, but it is an association of churches such as First Hereford and other churches in this area, Baptist churches, that cooperate to do missions together, that continue to cooperate to do ministries in a much wider range than what one church is able to do. And so it's always our privilege to be able to help you. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to be here and just share with you today. Um, some of your former pastors were good friends of mine, going back to uh, Ron Cook and Kyle Strine. And I was asking Jacob Laura if B.L. Davis had pastored here. He said, I have no clue. Uh, but B.L. Davis was pastor here many years ago. And uh, B.L.'s gone on to be with the Lord. He was also director of missions for the Amarillo Association. Uh, he died in 2010. I mention him particularly because thinking this morning about hero, be heroes because the sermon is titled, A Time for Heroes. And I define heroes really as ordinary people, such as you and certainly me, doing what God calls them to do day in and day out. So it's not extraordinary things, usually. It can be but usually it doesn't involve extraordinary measures. B.L. Davis was a tank commander at the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, and I was privileged to be able to talk to him many times about that. He didn't like to talk about it. Uh, it was one of the most crucial battles in Europe in world, late World War II, as the U.S. and its allies had invaded Europe, and then Germany tried to retake much of that territory and men and, and women, but men such as B.L. Davis, who was the tank commander standing in the way and forcing freedom in a land that was very difficult. We live in a, in a world today where we need heroes. We need them badly. We need them in a church context. We need people such as you and me doing what God's called us to do right here in this community, and that's what really church means. That's what it means to be God's people. That's what it means to be a Christian, is to do what God has called us to do, and yet is very difficult at times. I want to look at the book of Numbers today. We'll read about a couple of heroes in a historical sense. If you've been to Sunday school long, this won't be a surprise passage to you. You will have studied it a lot. If you haven't been to Sunday school, it's still a great, it's a great story. Go back and read more of it later. The book of Numbers, I understand, is not always the most fascinating, uh, enthralling book to us. It doesn't always just draw us in. But here's a great story in the book of Numbers. It's concerning the spies going out into the land, the promised land that God had promised to the Israelites. At, remember, they had left Egypt. They'd crossed the Red Sea. Moses had led them out from the Pharaoh's uh, out from under the Pharaoh's thumb, where they'd been slaves, basically, to the Egyptians for decades. And now, after they'd wandered around in that wilderness for, for many years, God had told Moses to appoint 12 spies, one from each tribe of the people of Israel, to go over the Jordan River, to cross into what was termed the promised land. God had promised the land to the people of Israel. And yet there were other people in that land already. And so as the spies went out and came back, the focus of this passage really is on their report. It's not so much on wandering in the promised land, but it's what they saw and then the reaction of the people themselves. So I'm going to read verses 26 in chapter 13 till the end of the passage. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. 
Here's its fruit. That's just another way of saying it's the most, most fertile, beautiful land you can imagine. And they brought back a great amount of the fruit to share with the people. But, they say, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there, a great warrior. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. What they're saying is, we went into this land, you said that God gave us this land, he told us to go and that it's ours, but there's, it's already full of people. People are already there. Verse 30, then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, they said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are great size. That's, I'm sure that wasn't true. There probably were some big people there, but they weren't all of great size, but they're exaggerating here a little bit. They said, the land we, we explored devours those living in it. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Those people are so big, they said, we're just like little grasshoppers compared to them. Now, re remember that that God had given the land to the Israelites. He'd told them it was theirs. He'd brought them to this point. He said, just go look at it, and you can take it. But the people dug in their feet and said no. The majority report here is, no, we can't take it at all. Maybe remarkable similarities for where we find ourselves today. God's given us so much. He empowers us. We spoke about and we sang about the Holy Spirit, you're welcome here, and he is. And we're empowered by the Holy Spirit today to do God's work. And I feel like this church stands on the cusp of greatness in reaching this community and the world. And so a question is, are we willing to go forward and do what God's called us to do? Or are we going to dig in our feet and say, no, no, we can't do it. We aren't enough. And we're not if we're trusting our own power. Look at a couple things here with me. Uh, the points are on the back of your uh, worship folder there if you want to watch, if you want to follow along just by the points. I may be tied to mine, I may not be. But the first one is that, that God helps in recognizing the opposition today. He did then in the times of the Israelites, and I think he does for us as well. It's hard sometimes. It's difficult to really understand who the opposition is that we face. We can talk about the people of the world, we can talk about culture, we can talk about all the things we don't like, but who is the opposition? The real enemy for the Israelites at that time was themselves. Their own lack of faith, their own dependence on their own strength, rather than on what God had given to them. They weren't depending on God, they were depending on their strength. And they said, we're just like grasshoppers. That's how big they were little tiny grasshoppers, and we're up against these giant people who have everything. Who is the opposition? Here in verses 27, they said, we went into the land which you sent us, and you're right, it's beautiful, it flows with milk and honey, but, but the people who live there are powerful. How easy it is for us to focus on the, on the things that are against us, the things we don't have, our weakness, and forget that God has given us a mission to accomplish. Jesus has called us to follow him every day, and he's promised to empower us and give us what we need in order to fulfill that mission. The real enemy here was themselves, their lack of faith, and their self-reliance. God had expressly led the spies into the promised land. He showed it to them, but all they could see were the obstacles. They focused on the obstacles. We're surrounded often in ministry and in life and in just in daily life 
by naysayers, the ones who say, no, 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 we can't do that, we can't do that. And I think there's a, there's a real difference between just being negative, certainly in the church, and saying Nothing, nothing's ever going to work. There's a difference between general negativity and saying this may be a problem, but we can address the problem. Are we part of the solution or are we just part of the problem? The Israelite spies, 10 out of the 12, were naysayers. No, we can't do it. Those who are, who are there, those who are against us are far too powerful. They forgot that mighty God, Jehovah, the one who had led them out of the desert, was the one who empowered them and who would allow them to take the land. They also, most of them, weren't, weren't enabled to go into it. They came to the point here on the Jordan River, and because the people, we'll see in a minute, because the majority of the people just dug their feet in, God said, you're not crossing the river. You'll never see the promised land. Only a few chosen got to go and do that, where really all of them could have had the ability to do that. God help us recognize who the opposition is, and sometimes, quite often, it's ourselves. It's ourselves and our own lack of faith. The second thing I would see here is that that God calls and equips for His service, but not everybody responds. Here in 13, again, chapter 31, but the men who had gone up with Him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they'd explored. God called all 12 of these men to go and be spies. But 10 of them brought back a negative report. It might be a reminder for us that at times the majority is not always correct. 10 out of 12 here said, no, we're not going. It's great, but it's not worth the cost. Even though God had led them out of Egypt for the very purpose of going and taking that very land, they said, nope, we can't do it. The majority is not always correct. It wasn't then, and it's not always correct today. It's not always wrong either, by the way. Majority is not always wrong. I think sometimes as Baptists, we, we look at it and say, well, majority rules in a church. And often that is how we conduct business but the church itself is not a democracy. We get lost in our Baptist polity sometime. And, and we say, well, well, we're Baptists, thus we are democratic. And we do have democratic principles. We do believe in the priesthood of the believer where each one of us, each individual here who acknowledges Christ, has the responsibility to function as a priest that the Holy Spirit speaks to you just as the Holy Spirit speaks to me. But that doesn't make the church a democracy. It really is a theocracy with Jesus Christ as the head, and the church belongs to him. And so the majority is not always correct, but it's not always wrong. Here in this passage, we just see that leaders are called to a position of responsibility, not privilege. They had a responsibility to take what God had given to them, bring it back to the people and say, this is it. God's brought us here. And only Caleb and Joshua were equal to that choice and to that calling. In chapter 14, uh, verse 9, Caleb said, Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone. But the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid. Caleb and Joshua embraced the leadership, the responsibility that God gave to them. They were really the true heroes of the day in saying, folks, let's listen to the voice of God. And I hope today, especially at First Baptist Hereford, and every day, we're saying, what does God have for us as his people? That's really what being a hero would be in our society today. Lord, what do you have for me? Can I hear your voice? And then, God, give me the strength and the power to do it. Third thing I see from this is that God shows choices have to be made, and they're not always easy. Folks, we come to a day, sometimes we can't have everything. We we have to make choices. 
we have to listen to what God's saying. We have to hear his voice and trust his leadership. And sometimes that's difficult to have the unity to do that. But here in this passage, Joshua Caleb said, choices have to be made. Are we going to just stay here on this side of the Jordan River forever? We can't even provide ourselves enough to eat and water to drink. God had provided miraculously day by day for the people. He'd sent manna, he'd sent quail. He provided enough for them to drink, but it wasn't the promised land, and yet they wanted to stay there. In fact, many of them, if you read this, said, we should just turn around and go back to Egypt. We should go back to being slaves. Joshua and Caleb said, no, listen to the voice of God. Listen to that. Why? Because God is powerful. He's taken the protection away from our enemies. And they will succumb to us. And eventually they did. Eventually they did. But not with Moses as the leader. Moses didn't make it to the promised land. So the people went forward under Joshua's leadership. We won't read about that today. God shows us that choices have to be made. I would just say to you at First Baptist Hereford today, I hope that you would recognize God's call to keep proper priorities. I, I don't know what those always are other than in serving God. The first priority is, as in Matthew, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And the focus is not on things that are added to us. There are that God will grant to us and to you as a church what you need in making decisions. Keep the proper priorities. Sometimes that comes at a cost. You remember the rich ruler who asked Jesus, Master, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And what did Jesus respond to him in uh, Matthew chapter 19 and following, the, also in Luke? Not going to read it, but Jesus said, ultimately, give up everything. Sell all that you have. Take up your cross daily and follow me. And the rich ruler went away because the cost was too high for him to pay. And so sometimes when God calls us, he calls us to a life of sacrifice at times, to give things up. The Christian life's not all about having and having more and getting what we want. It's often a, it's often a call to sacrifice everything for God. And that's difficult for us. Perhaps the people here, the Israelites, looked at that and they said, if we go up, we're going to be fighting people who are so strong, they'll, they will devour us, they'll swallow us up because we're like tiny grasshoppers. It's going to come at a cost that's too high. It really, once you start reading what comes after this, was pretty easy in a way. The conquest of the land was fairly easy because God went before them. God empowered them. And they trusted him, the ones who were privileged to go forward. Sometimes the choice is to refuse to listen to the naysayers. Because God has called you and he's called me to higher things, to service, to be heroes in our community and in this church and touching the lives of individuals. God needs heroes like you and me serving him today. The last thing I see in this passage is that choosing God means trusting God. It's one thing to say, oh yeah, I'll, I trust God, I go to church and everything's good, but choosing God means really giving your life to Him in every way and saying, God, I not only choose you today, but I surrender to you. Again, what Caleb said, only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will, swallow them, we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Folks, we need to realize just like Caleb and Joshua did that God is always faithful. He's always faithful to you and I. And in fact, it recorded in 2 Timothy, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful 
Why? Because he cannot disown himself, that passage says. It's in God's nature to be faithful to you and I. So when we trust him, he will always, always be faithful. We also know that God has provided a way. For the Israelites, he said, I know that all those people are there. I know they're powerful. I know they've filled up the land, but the land belongs to you. I've provided a way for you to go and take it. And for the church today, I think the message is the same. God's provided a way for First Baptist Hereford to make a difference in this community. You've done that for decades. Will you continue to do that? Trusting God. And we have to respond. We have to make a positive choice and live a dedicated life. I love the passage later on in Joshua. You know this well, but Joshua, near the end of his life, could look back at these times that he had in difficulty. And he could say, now then, and this is Joshua, uh, excuse me, that was, the, that was Caleb. Um, but Joshua saying, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away, you, the, <clears throat> excuse me, throw away the gods of your forefathers, worshipped beyond the river and e Egypt. He's saying, you've had all these other gods, these false gods, these gods of security, the gods of holding, that hold you back. Your idols, he said, throw them away. He's speaking to the people, even as they've gone into the promised land and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Who will you serve today? It's a time for heroes in our society. Not people, perhaps, who go out and do incredible, uh, extraordinary things, but touching one life at a time. Those really are the heroes of our society. It's a story probably also not true, but maybe. An old man was walking along the beach at dawn and he saw this young man picking up starfish and throwing them back into the ocean. There were literally hundreds of starfish on the beach and as the waves came in, they got beached and couldn't get back into the water. The old man looked at the younger man and said, what on earth are you doing? He said, well, the starfish will die if I let them sit in the sun. The older man looked at him and said, there's miles and miles of ocean and there's thousands of starfish. Can your effort make even a little bit of difference? And the young man picked up another one and threw it back in and it said it makes a difference to that one. Perhaps we can't do everything, but God calls us to make a difference. He's called you and I to live our lives under his leadership and his working out in front of us, making a difference in this community.